Welcome everyone, this is the Red Hat Jables hands on lab. The thing is, um, the, the program of this evening is actually very simple. I typically give about 45 minutes on, uh, on uh, OpenShift on a deep dive. I, in this case, I will skip the context. If you ever want me to speak about the context, invite me. I'll leave some business card here on the edge of the table or if you come find me afterwards. Or if you can remember that I'm called Hool, R-O-E-L, at redhat.com, that works as well. Um, I'm the only one within Red Hat that helps. Um, so 45 minutes of a little bit of theory of what you're going to see with OpenShift itself. After the 45 minutes, there's a URL you can follow. It's a tiny URL slash RH for Red Hat or for Hool Altman, say whatever you like hands-on lab. It'll give you a link to my uh, Google Drive in which it contains two files. One is the instructions uh, in abbreviated form which it also gives you the login details. The second one is more about more extended version with more theory around it but it goes into deeper detail like uh, clustering your JBoss environment on OpenShift stuff like that. So it's a little bit more advanced. Both workshops can be done via the machines I've provided with you today, which is our single instances OpenShift on AWS. Uh, I have here a list of uh, credentials you can try. If one of them fails, I will give you a new one. I have plenty of machines pinned up just to be 100% sure. Additionally, um, there's a container development kit available via the Red Hat website. If you just search for Red Hat Developer Program, you can find a um, free subscription. You only have to leave your email address behind. And if you log in, you get access to basically most of the Red Hat software, including OpenShift as a single instance, uh, as a vagrant image. So, a little bit of background on OpenShift. If we just First, there's a little bit of show of hands for you guys uh, to give me some info. So, who already played around with OpenShift? So, I see four or five of you. Um, who did more than Hello World of the five? Uh, only two. See? Okay. Good. Uh, for you, it might be interesting to look at the... Oh, oh, no, let me start with first with another question. Which version of OpenShift? Version 2 or version 3? 2. Ah, see. Okay, version 2 and version 3 of OpenShift uh, are conceptually the same, uh, but technically completely different. So where OpenShift 2 talks about cartridges, OpenShift 3 talks about Docker containers and Docker images, OpenShift 2 talks about the broker, architecture and OpenShift 3 we talk about Kubernetes, completely different beast, uh, only in, in, in usage or uh, usage scenarios there is there any similarity. So um, that brings me to my next question. Who of you played around with Docker? Ah that's a little bit more. That's good. Uh, who did more than Hello World with Docker? About oh, 60, 70 percent I'm, I'm I'm impressed, guys. Well done. Applause for you. Uh, who played around with Kubernetes? Okay, cool. <coughs> so, um, just to remember, OpenShift built on this technology. I'll go into detail in, uh, in, uh, in a bit in my presentation. But the one thing I want to emphasize, um, there is no intention of Red Hat to fork anything. Uh, there's a lot of discussion around Docker, that Docker wants, uh, says that, uh, that companies say that Red Hat wants to fork Docker. That's not the case. We have an official statement. If you want to know it, uh, let me know. I'll share it with you. Um, it's been given by people that can explain that much better than I can. Um, what is important that at the moment we provide a, uh, the capability of adopting pure Docker or pure Kubernetes APIs directly into OpenShift. So if you wrote something in a vanilla Docker environment without Red Hat's OpenShift included in there, and it's for the right version, you can just include it into your OpenShift environment without any type of translation. Same goes for Kubernetes. Yeah. 
Only you need to do check 100% sure that you have the right version. Yeah. So, OpenShift, deep dive. Um, let's get started. So, uh, OpenShift, our container platform as a service. It's um, actually a project about uh, six or seven years old in its current form with OpenShift version. Two was the first one we really exposed to the outside world. We had an OpenShift one. It's never got past the, the te technology preview, got rewritten a couple of times into version 2, which is running on Amazon. But that's not the only place where you can run OpenShift. You can run o OpenShift actually anywhere RHEL can run, so Red Hat Enterprise Linux can run, as long as it's x86 or 64-bit uh, compliant. Am I understandable in the back? <laughs> Piece of crap. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Screw the mic. Anyway, um, so uh, OpenShift um, uh, runs on physical hardware as long as it's x86, 46 bit, on virtual hardware, whether it's VMware or uh, Microsoft or Red Hat, we don't care. As long as RHEL runs on this hypervisor, it's fine. It runs on private cloud. Oh, obviously, OpenStack is the most well-known private cloud. It will run on OpenStack as well. There's even some added benefits you can have if you run it on, uh, on OpenStack. Uh, public cloud. Um, as long as it's a Red Hat certified cloud solution, certified cloud solution provider is a new name. I always mess up. Used to be two programs, but it's now one. Uh, it's fine. It can be Amazon, it can be Azure, it can be uh, uh, Google's cloud, that doesn't matter. It can be another cloud as well. We have actually, in the Netherlands, we are expanding our uh, amount of partners, but there's uh, OpenLine and ABB are actually working as we speak on getting the offer extended in the near future, I think hopefully this year already. Um, but there's also external providers like T-Systems runs a cloud where you can uh, just ask for, uh, for OpenShift. So it's actually completely agnostic of the infrastructure. Yeah. Just two things to remember, Red Hat Enterprise Linux does not run on it. In case of OpenShift, it's uh, version 7, 7.3 7 for the latest, 7.4 already. Three. Uh, three, at least. And then uh, x86 46 bit hardware. Yeah? So no IBM software or something. Mm -hmm. On it, it'll run instances called nodes. What's the node? It's actually where your application spaces are going to land. It's not anything more than your host for your machines. There is a slash between it. There's a Red Hat Enterprise Linux and a Red Hat. Atomic host. Anybody heard of Atomic host already? Yeah, I see a couple of hands. Not enough, so I'll explain the difference. So actually what we did is we made the normal RHEL available as an OpenShift node. It's, it's a normal Red Hat Enterprise Linux, you all know. Uh, hopefully it's, a, it's an RPM based distribution of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, right? That's a normal one. We also made Atomic. Why did we make Atomic? We made actually a version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux we stripped to the absolute bare bones necessities to run a container image. Hence the name Atomic, because it's unsplittable, right? We're not very original in naming. And the other difference is it's not RPM based, it's image based. So you approach the host of the same manner as you do the containers inside that host. So if you want to make an adjustment to the atomic host, you make a new image out of it and you apply that image to the server. Less moving parts, less chance to go, go have something go wrong. It also means less flexibility. It's as simple as that. It's always a trade-off. In the nodes, we run Docker containers. Like I said, right? 
So a vanilla Docker container, you can basically run any kind of Docker container in that, as long as the versions are compatible. Um, I actually, in the um, second, the most extensive of the labs, um, there's an example of an Ubuntu Docker container running on OpenShift. OpenShift doesn't really care. The um, support department does, however. <laughs> right? We can't support you if you run on an Ubuntu image. It's that simple. Uh, we'll support you in running the Docker daemon, we support you that it stays up, but that's it, right? It's that simple. But Debian or any of the other flavors is fine as well. <coughs> no. To um, be able to group containers, there's a possibility of, uh, yeah, it's not just grouping, but containers are actually run in pods. Anybody know why it's called a pod, by the way? Hmm. Ever seen the logo from Docker? What's the logo of Docker? It's a whale. It's a whale. How, does it, how, do, how is a group of whales called? A pod. Well, again, not original in naming, right? <laughs> but it makes sense. So, in the, what's, what's the difference? Um, so you start with the Docker image, right? It's your recipe, it's the recipe of your deployment, which is where you say which are ports, uh, ports you want to open, what your workload you want to run into, where you base your image off. And the fun part is, and what I think for me as jo a former job developer makes most sense, is that there, it has an inheritance structure. You, so you can use a space image, for instance, a Reddit base image. You can stack layer for layer your deployments on that. Though I would give you a little bit of caution, don't go overboard. If you have more than th three layers, you need to start thinking that maybe some of the layers don't make that much sense, right? There's a bit of common rationality you need to use with it. Um, in the container, that's the actual runtime, and the pod is the mechanism around it. What is the good thing about a pod? A pod shares stuff. Now you know all or you should know that containers are immutable and that they run as an, in isolation but sometimes you need to technically separate stuff but run them as a single unit and that's where a pod works in. Pods share, um, uh, for instance, share uh, volume claims, pods share ports, ports share namespace. The pod shares a local host IP address so that Containers within the same port can reach each other over the local host address. Yeah. So it might be also for latency use cases. Yeah. Downside is as long as you share, you get post potentially. If I have both containers in the port both want to use port 80, that's not possible. Yeah. If you run two pods on the same host and they both want port 80, that'll work. Because each is unique within that host. Right. There's lots of magic on the tables. If you want to know it, just ask them. <laughs> the uh, administrator and orchestrator of the platform is running on the master. Master nodes is run by Kubernetes. Uh, you know it, it's a Google project. It's actually uh, Google's designated follower up for the Borg project. Who knows the Borg? Uh, except for Star Trek, of course. Yeah, about three or four line. So, what you need to remember is that anything in Google runs in a container, whether it's a search engine, whether it's your Gmail session, whatever, it all runs in containers. They use Borg to orchestrate that. Even the VMs run in containers? Yeah. So they have a need to manage containers, you can imagine, right? And, and let's be honest, we had the VM sprawl in which we went from uh, physical servers to virtual machines. And the virtual machines was a multitude of the physical hosts. You get the same problem with, uh, with, with containers. Because uh, what I typically find in my customers is that the customers run it on a hypervisor, whether it's a cloud hypervisor or a private hypervisor, that doesn't matter for this case. And they, on average, run up to 30 to 40 containers per virtual server. So if you now have 10,000 servers, times 30 to 40, it's 30,000 to 40,000 specific machines, right? Uh, even, even zero extra. 
So if you don't standardize, if you don't automate, you're going to go bananas. Yep. We use Kubernetes to make that manageable. What does Kubernetes do for you? Well, it's a single ingress point for all API calls to your platform. Both authentication, which is the authentication of the platform itself, not for your apps. It's like the um, access to the platform and what role-based access controls you have. It's also the API, and, to, uh, um, and this is different than some of the other products we have. The API is the first class citizen. What does that mean? That means that anything you use to interact with OpenShift, whether you go via the command line, whether you go via the UI, so the user interface, or you go via developer tooling, it always talks to the API. So if you want to know what's most feature complete, it's the API on, at, in first place, it's the command line interface in second place, and then the third is the UI. You'll probably notice it during the workshops as well. It's a little bit older version of OpenShift. The command line is more feature complete than the UI. Yeah. I always joke about the alliance we have with Microsoft uh, currently, that we need to teach them to type and they need us to click. <laughs> right, <laughs> which kind of is true if you think about uh, this uh, this case, right? It also has a data store. In it, it stores key value pairs, and the key value pairs are actually quite simple. In an etcd, it's an etc daemon. Uh, it's a clustered key value store where you use an arbitrary key to store a value. What it is, I'll go into detail later, and you'll notice that during the, the workshop as well. It's basically any state of the cluster is stored there. And what's cool about etcd is that as long as you got a quorum, it'll self, it, it self or it self clusters. So if you have multiple instances, they'll look for each other. They should form a cluster, and as soon as one dies. One of the other nodes will notice that. The first one that notices that is a, it immediately made master. The one thing you need to keep in mind is actually a common problem if you cluster is the split brain problem. So uh, OpenShift requires you to have a quorum. So you need an odd, uh, yeah, an odd number, right? So three, five, and even more. Although, do you ever encounter a use case where you need more than five masters or ETCDs? No. We, we actually did performance test with the Kubernetes cluster of uh, 1,000 nodes, and it turned out that three masters was enough to to um, to manage a thousand nodes. So. So that's 40,000 containers. So if you have requirements over that, then you need probably more, right? The other thing it does, it provides a scheduler, and the scheduler is one of my favorite bits of technologies for two reasons. One is what it does. It's actually, it's a placement scheduler, not a time-based scheduler. So what the placement, what this scheduler does is look at your configuration on how you want the cluster to be, and uh, what the current situation of the cluster is, and compares them. And as soon as they see the difference, there's a different component that will give it the uh, order to make sure that the current state matches the desired state. Placement rules, there's a, um, I always forget the names, so there's, there's predicates, and what's the other one again? Yeah, there's a, there, there's a, a set of rules, affinity and anti-affinity rules, there's rules that always have to be true, right? Uh, this port needs to be available, period, right? There's a, there's a zero or one, it's, it's true or it's not true. And there's also a weighted factor, so in case of choose the node that has the least work, uh, work on it, right? It's a, it's a placement scheduler in this case, that it does actually, it's, it's remarkably similar like a select query in SQL, where it determines based on the state of the nodes and the labels you give on the nodes, because OpenShift works with, with labels, it's more like a sticker capability, um, in which it does the placement. For instance, so if I, in this case, have defined this node as being a schedulable for production workloads, only production workloads will land on that thing, right? 
If I say all the others are test nodes, then production workloads won't get scheduled to the test server. Right. It's just a simple way of making difference between, you could say half of them is DC, uh, uh, is, is, um, is cluster one, and the other half is or data center one, and the other half is data center two, for instance, if you want to make sure that a workload gets spread out across the, the data centers. It's that simple. Second reason why I like the scheduler is because it's not written by us. And you think, well, that's not that weird. If you would join, do a joint venture with Google, it must be written by Google. But it isn't either. So actually, one of our customers, reference customers, Amadeus, uh, said to themselves, I want to use Kubernetes and Docker as well, back, I think it's three years ago now. <coughs> Um, and instead of reinventing the wheel ourselves, we'll provide a couple of skilled engineers and we'll work with Red Hat jointly to build on the solution. And that's what I like about this one, because they wrote the scheduler. Because Amadeus, for, uh, for, for your information, it's a, it's a broker between uh, hotels, airlines, and all that. So if you done, uh, you went to Trivago and you said, I want to fly. So who, who of you went on, on flying vacation this year? Jesus, you guys need more vacation. <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> so only two. But hey, those two chose, uh, probably chose some, some kind of broker site or they went to, the, the, to, the, to an agency. That agency uses the infrastructure of, um, of uh, Amadeus to actually query all uh, potential options, right? And they needed to differentiate, uh, to, to quote all, well, uh, all animals are created equal, but some are more equal than others. The same applies to your workloads, right? Uh, some workloads are more important, even in production, as uh, your critical banking system has more priority than the one you order your pencil and, uh, and, and, and gums with, right? It's not that important. It's production, still needed, but it's not as important. So they needed this functionality as well and they wrote it. So, um, And it, it, it incorporates what differentiates Red Hat from its competitors, right? If you want something in the product, Yes, you can request Red Hat. You can do that at VMware and uh, Pivotal as, just as easily, or well, maybe, and uh, with IBM as well. Uh, but if, if you're not getting it, you can contribute it yourself, right? That's, that's what makes it different. We grow because we share as one of our slogans. I think it's really incorporated in this. So, Placement is defined, predefined policies, so depending on your policy, you can say, okay, give me all nodes that are labeled test, and I want to deploy my workload on that. Give me all nodes that are deployed on test, but give, me, give uh, emphasis to the ones that have the least workloads. Okay. Problem if, is, if you start to make placement based on a uh, weighted factor, then you're not 100% sure where a workload's gonna land. Because the query on which node has the le least workload might be different in five seconds than it is now. So you need something to differentiate and to make sure that you can always find the node you're looking for. So in this use case, uh, there's three Tomcat services uh, in running in containers and three MongoDB instances. And they need to connect to each other. And yes, you could say, well, why don't they just connect to each other, right? They're on the same machine. But that's not possible. We use the intermediate of a service for that. Why is it? It's actually, let's see. Yeah, uh, I'll skip that one. If a pod goes down, there's a concept within OpenShift that's called a replicator. And a replicator will look at your state of your cluster and say, hey, but I had three Tomcat instances, and I said the absolute minimum of Tomcat instances was three, and now one is burning down. Start, start a new one somewhere else. And you now see what the problem is if you would connect directly, because this one is on a different machine than this one. And if you think about it even further, 
if you look at ports, you see here there's two Tomcat Docker containers on the same machine anyway. So, and if they have both port 80, you get a port conflict, right? Mm -hmm. You can give port 80 only once. So there's a trick under the covers that has to do with IP tables and, and, and um, SkyDNS. There's lots of explaining about that one. But it, it, gets, it gets virtualized. You get a virtual IP, right? And that makes, makes it extremely hard to connect these systems directly. And then the service comes along. So you define a label saying Tomcat service. And you define a label called Mongo service. And what it, the system does, is it stores inside the data store where these containers run. So if you do a request from the Tomcat service to the Mongo service, it'll look in, inside the cluster where is one and give you that one. That means you have complete flexibility to even kill a complete node. The workloads, the replication controller, or the, that's, that start with the beginning. The scheduler will look at the current state of the cluster, sees that a difference from the desired state of the cluster, tells the replication controller it needs to start a new instance somewhere else. That new instance gets worked into HCCD, and then the workload can be found because the service is automatically updated. There's zero manual interaction in this. As long as you have enough nodes. As long as you have enough nodes, that's true. <laughs> Good thing is, it's not just all OpenShift. We also have a product called CloudForms, and CloudForms can handle the state of the cluster. We thought of that one. <laughs> yeah, is that clear, or does anybody still have questions about that one? If the master fails. If the master fails, then you need to have more masters than one. Or, or if there's nothing changed, you can restart the master, but your mileage may vary. It's a better idea to have multiple masters. But the containers on the nodes keep on running without masters. Yes. It's just uh, when you start doing dynamic key stuff in the cluster, then it, yeah. you better have an active master. That helps <laughs> a lot. I saw a question there. Yeah? Where's the client connected to? That's the next slide. That's now, one slide after that. <laughs> um, state. So, uh, one of the things I typically talk to my customers about, it's not around the, the adoption of uh, technology like OpenShift. Yes, obviously it is, because that's the, we're a technology vendor, so we sell technology. But first, before you understand how this works, to get the maximum gain, out of this kind of architecture and all about that dynamicness eh, of rescheduling a container somewhere else, you need to talk about your application architecture. Because I can, so OpenShift doesn't care what your workload is. If you want to run a RHEL 6 container on this system with a monolithic app, no problem. OpenShift will handle it. It's, it's RHEL, right? It's, 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 it's RHEL in a specific format, but it's still RHEL. So you can run anything, even a .NET application nowadays, right? What's important to, if you want to gain the elasticity this platform can give you, you need to have an application that handles its state in a different manner. And that means externalizing state. Either to a system like Mongo, like uh, Cassandra, that can elastically handle states resizing, yeah? You can add, add additional Cassandra nodes and you apply sharding, same with Mongo, and it grows and so it can take the changing environment. Or you externalize it either to persistent storage or to an external relational database, for instance. I see that a lot, a lot of our customers are still running Oracle databases. Now, Oracle doesn't allow you to run an Oracle database inside a container because it's not certified for their site, and I can understand, I mean, if it's not certified, how you want to support it, right? Um, so you need some kind of um, other way to handle your, uh, your, uh, your external state. Um, 
And that's why you don't put it in the OpenShift cluster unless you have an elastic environment, right? Persistent storage, uh, we can handle um, most of the storage forms I know, so Fiber, NFS, S3, uh, Ceph, Cluster, you name it, right? There's an addi additional benefit to ch choose Red Hat storage over the other ones. Um, that's uh, actually, with OpenShift you get abstraction from your infrastructure. If you, for instance, run on Amazon and you directly couple your OpenShift environment to F S3, and then you need to move your workspace to Azure, for instance, then you're tied to the S3 interface, right? You need to rewrite stuff. If you use Red Hat Storage as an abstraction layer on your S3, so you still use S3, you just use uh, Red Hat Storage as an access point to it, you can move to Azure and don't have to rewrite. It's that simple. And since OpenShift itself is usually typically installed with Ansible, you just rerun your playbook. You, you configure your playbook a little bit different because uh, Azure is not completely the same as Amazon. But in essence, you just rerun your playbook and your application workloads can move from one cloud to the other, right? So that, that's the, the biggest benefit. So I highly emphasize that if you run an OpenShift cluster to get abstraction from your underlying layers, think about Red Hat Storage at the very least. And then, as promised, the answer, what do your clients connect to? They connect to routes. So here you see a multiple, not multitude of devices. What they do is they access a specific DNS name within the namespace. And OpenShift is divided up into projects, and each project is its own software-defined network. The route is the only ingress layer into that software-defined network. It's managed by default, you don't have to do anything for it, that's how the, the, the system normally works. But you define DNS name, and that DNS name is coupled to a service. So when I request, for instance, uh, tomcat.reddit.com as a DNS name, it'll look into the data store, which is the service that actually runs Tomcat. Oh, I need to be here, and from the service it goes to the actual Tomcat containers. It's completely managed by the system. It also does the load balancing. You can have it sticky, or round robin, or something else, but you need to break code for it. You, um, what it does under the covers, it uses a software load balancer, HA proxy, but even that is configurable. If you want to reuse your existing F5 load balancer, that's fine as well. OpenShift has a client to feed your F5 with the configuration inside the cluster as well. Yeah. I like that one, it's pretty cool. Oh, so you, need to, you always need to master if you want to well, yes and no. You need the functionality that's on the master. You can externalize parts of that into an infrastructure node. Actually, when we do an HA setup, so an high availability setup, we actually split out the master into more specific roles. Um, uh, but yes, you need the routing layer to be there to differentiate between which software-defined network you actually need and which actually instance do you actually need? Yes, that's correct. The HA proxy router is nothing more than a container. So you can schedule the routing container anywhere on the node. Yeah, and what we typically do is we have infrastructure nodes. It runs not just in the, the routing layer, but also, uh, for instance, Elasticsearch and the stuff like that. But I'll get to that later. Now, okay, so for instance, you split functionality that delivers that routing layer somewhere in the DNZ because clients will connect to it and other stuff is in your internal network because it's more secure. Yeah, 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 that's, that actually is a topology that makes sense. It's actually, um, it's, a, it's a good point. So what I, what I see in customer engagement, and Samuel can correct me if I'm, uh, if I'm wrong or, uh, in good, uh, or too summar uh, summarized, um, is that, um, Customers are actually looking into whether they should run multiple instances of the master 
for instance, one for production and one for the rest, or one master and run across all four normal staging areas, so like uh, development, test, acceptance, and production. There's actually, we don't mind that much, and the actual physical cost of the subscription for the master is, well, basically nil. Uh, it's, it's, it's a, there's, there's a fee uh, associated to it, but it's almost no, not anymore. Not anymore? Is the master free? For every node subscription, you get like four master subscriptions. Okay. So it's even updated to be free. Yeah. So it's more up to what you find suitable for your organization and your security and compliance officer, because that's typically the one with the most say on how the installation should look like. Uh, but we don't specifically care. Yeah. And that extends to the registry, because one of the things that's also in OpenShift includes an internal registry, a Docker registry, but you don't have to use it. To be more precise, you would even, uh, if you have multiple masters, you can sync the registries. Uh, you can do it manually or you can do it automated. Uh, but you also can use uh, private or even public, please don't do public, but public repositories as well to pull in images. If you do public, please, we did a research on Docker Hub of the images. It's, it's, it's a little bit older, so I'm not 100% sure that's still valid, but we found a lot of shell shock and heart bleed. Uh, so please, if you pull in public Docker images, first check them, please, please, <laughs> for your sake. Does that answer your question? Yes? Okay. You had a question. Yeah, if both masters die, do you lose your routing layer? Do you lose your connection? If you split off your routing layer into infrastructure nodes, no. So if you haven't done that, then you do lose them? Okay. Yes. If, well, it's, lose them. Yeah, but, but, but it doesn't matter if you... It's, it's the nodes on which you deploy your router, router containers. If they die, if they both die, you deploy them high available. But if they both die, then your routing layer dies and your whole cluster is, is offline. Mm -hmm. Yes. But then you need... So if you want to survive two, one, two failing, you need three. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's the same, same rule of thumb as you're used to in your normal deployment. If you want to survive five, then you need seven. <coughs> The same, same applies as like uh, like normal. The good thing is you can have the replicator make sure that there is five, because you say an absolute minimum of five, mm -hmm. and you can even specify an upper limit, and it gets even cooler. You can say scale with traffic. Uh, at the moment it's CPU, but with three three, it was already its memory also in. I have, to, I have to check whether, so uh, this week version 3.3 of OpenShift is coming out. Um, uh, the actual, um, what we're working on is, you guys from version, version 2 can already confirm that I, I think, is that we add auto scaling capability based on uh, CPU traffic or memory traffic on this space uh, uh, allocation. Um, with the redesign to version 3.3, three, uh, to version 3, we had to redesign that. And we started with CPU based, but we're working on all the others as well, that you can auto scale on, on traffic. So it starts up more containers as you wait. Go on. The idea is to make it uh, pluggable, that you can plug in external mm -hmm. metrics. Yes. Uh, based on those metrics, you can auto scale. So yep. in the future, you can scale on anything. Yeah, and that um, of course you can always manually scale as well. So uh, in inside the, the practices you're gonna or in the workshop you're gonna do, you actually manually scale it as well. So if you know that there's a spike coming, or you can even go as far as have uh, cloud forms, for instance. Cloud forms is the management suite that is provided with OpenShift for managing OpenShift. It can do a lot more, but you need a separate subscription for it. Um, you can see do a trend analysis, and if you see that every m first week of the month there's a spike, you can even tell OpenShift that uh, you can let CloudForms tell OpenShift that you need to spin up extra nodes on Monday 
and for to Friday and then spin them down again. That's no problem. Developers, um, but even manage, uh, admins, access the OpenShift via web command line interface or IDE. So it's basically, uh, there's, a, there's a web UI, you guys are going to use that as well. There's a command line interface, you're going to use that as well. And depending on the workshop, there's an integrated development environment or IDE, JBoss Developer Studio in our case, um, that you can use to interact with the system as well. There are other options, there's a REST API as well, you can directly write to the API, or you can use triggers from your CI. Like the metrics collection, for instance, is a specific one. You can define external services as well, so for instance, if you want to connect to a relational database, you want to configure that once for your environment, or once for your project, but it's a different case. And then you define an external service reference. It's just a label to your external service reference, so you have to define it only once. So your image is even more immutable. Um, for instance, your single sign-on solution uh, within with uh, OpenShift. Does spread that single sign-on come for free with OpenShift? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's, so I know every JBoss project except JBoss Web Server gets a Red Hat single sign-on for free. Uh, apparently with OpenShift uh, as well. So you can run um, uh, a single sign-on solution within the cluster as well, the container. Uh, that's maybe something you want to standardize for your entire environment. If you don't want to, you put it in your projects, it's fine as well. Yeah. So anything you do centrally, that's, that's shared across the cluster. Uh, in our case, uh, you'll see that the logging is shared. The good thing is, it's something that actually not every Elasticsearch install that I know has, is that um, if you do use uh, our Elasticsearch, it automatically gets um, restrained to the project where you are a member from. So if I'm accessing my uh, Elasticsearch environment, my Kibana dashboard, I can only see the data of my projects. I can't see the data of your projects, for instance. Actually, yeah. This is CI/CD flow. Um, in this case, you have a, uh, either a developer or ops make a change in the content management system or a source code management system, that's SCM, uh, either source or configuration. It gets built by a Jenkins. It does not need to be a Jenkins on OpenShift. It's actually very viable to run Jenkins on OpenShift. You can even have each build task be a separate slave in, a, in its own container, which makes the Jenkins server a lot more scalable than it used to be. Um, it builds, it makes an artifact. If you want to store the intermediate in the artifact repository, that's fine. And it builds an image out of it. What's the cool part, that it built images gets automatically deployed in the image registry, and the image registry automatically deploys it to your app environment. Like I said, it's all triggers. You can define the triggers in your application configuration, called the build configuration. Uh, you'll see that in the, in the samples. And the good thing is, with a simple pull push of even a label, like you can change a label, it can automatically trigger deployment to the next environment. So it's really easy to reuse, for instance, a Jenkins build pipeline have them change a label at the press of the button, and then the image is marked ready to go to the next phase in your test environment, or your acceptance environment, or in this case, the user acceptance test environment. And some of the customers separate out the image registry for production, and then you do push at the button, and the same deployment goes, but a little bit more steps in replicating the image to the production environment. You can do this completely automated, two presses of the button, one by the QA manager, one by the release manager, stuff is in production. And if you're really cool, you make sure that he can also roll back. OpenShift can, all images are versioned, 
So you can roll back to a previous version. Even the nodes themselves can roll back to a previous version. So if you apply an update to your atomic host, you can roll it back. Um, but you, if you're really cool, you can do press on the button rollbacks as well. And then you're ready to continue the deployment. Including faithful services? <laughs> yes and no, depending on uh, on um, on the how you implemented your state. So um, the biggest problem if you do uh, state changes uh, or do rollback of your state change, you have to be able to um, roll back your state. Eh? If you have a relational database, for instance, you can have OpenShift uh, define a hook and then roll out the script to roll back your database change. Um, but most of the actual in practice changes I've seen at your state um, are non rollbackable except if you push a new complete installation back to the system uh, and you put back a backup, right? It's, 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 there's no, no magic in OpenShift that makes that easy. Let's, let's put it like that. So by design you should take that into account when you make the assistant whether or not you want to use it. Yes. Yes, I, I, I must be honest. I typically um, externalize, I would advise you to externalize the state in something that that can can change that state, either with a with a Mongo or something on site OpenShift, or you externalize it. But even more, I would like um, I don't know. Do you know Jibble's data virtualization? No. No. So we have a product called da data virtualization. Obviously, um, it's uh, actually it's um, the product can do lots. Uh, the product can be form a virtual database above multiple data stores, so you have an ERP system like SOP or something like similar, and you have a database or multiple databases with your data in, is it can do a read access, uh, read write access view on those databases. I, I typically compare it with a materialized view, right? You can say I need this data from this data store and this data from this data store and combine them in a single view. You can reuse that same mechanism to provide simultaneously two views on your data. For instance, the data model V1 and the data model V11. Mm -hmm. And that abstracts some of the pain of running multiple data, so multiple versions of your data model at the same time. But it's still, it's every time you do a services landscape or a microservices landscape, whatever, is, uh, or a SOA landscape for the guys like me that think microservices is just a little pragmatism of SOA. Um, the problem does not go away. It, 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 you can reduce impact, but in the end you need to uh, really think, think about your architecture. And it's hard, I have to admit, it's really hard. The more you microservices or the more you service your landscape, the harder it will be. We had a customer where we had a JVM environment and uh, five nodes, and they all use some data source, the process of JVM. Yeah. And uh, what we saw was that even though the systems were not fully utilized, uh, JVM just stopped working. And so, right. 75% of my experience when something is not working, there's something went wrong in the application somewhere with some component. Mm -hmm. I can't see you and this will solve that problem. <laughs> it's, it's, it's true, true. It's, uh, you need to design your application to, to handle this kind of things. It's, it's, um, you need to really, really automate test. Um, the thing is, there's no silver bullet in, in this manner. It's, it's, like you say, it's typically a problem in application. What this tool does help you with is actually, if you have uh, a description of your landscape in, inside the t an a, a description like uh, our application template which you guys are going to play with it it's the way you define uh, we talked about routes, we talked about services, we talked about containers, we talked about source to image if you want <coughs> a recipe that describes all that we put it in a YAML or a JSON file that's called a template that describes the complete complex landscape, right? And you can do 
you can create a template beforehand, or when you build your complex uh, landscape, you generate a, a template from it, right? So if you have the template of your situation uh, at the end of the day, yeah, you generate it, then in the night you can use your CI/CD tooling to kill the whole environment, put in your automated test template in, run all your tests, stress, load stress, stress test, uh, integration test, and then the next morning kill the entire environment, bring up the situation they left behind yesterday, and then go on like business as usual. And that's the only way where this system really helps you in this. The other things is just common sense. <coughs> and maybe a little bit of table state. <coughs> and then the last slide before you guys can do stuff and I stop talking, or at least I hope. Um, so we worked hard on getting the full JBoss middleware services available as XPass. Uh, uh, Gartner was thinking about uh, new um, names for uh, for integration platform as a service, application platform as a service, mobile backend as a service. So we got fed of it and said XPass, where you choose your X. Um, so what do we have running? We have a JBoss Enterprise application platform, so it's a JEA7 compliant app server. Uh, it's the, uh, the Tomcat servlet, servlet container is running on it. Well, JBoss developer in studio doesn't run on it, it interacts with it. Um, the business process management is still being worked on, uh, but the rules engine is already working on it. Who's actually using a rules engine in general? Only two. So, so there's some work to, for us to still be done. Uh, integration services, so Fuse, uh, it's our uh, integration platform, or you, in the old days you would say ESB, but apparently that's a swear word nowadays. Um, the good thing is, uh, actually, um, that I want to have emphasize, Fuse is already, in the old version, was already built to work in a distributed manner with a central management which automatically benefits a lot from the OpenShift architecture where we, we, in the old days we would separate out in Java containers well, now we use Docker containers and the system still works so that really works well if you traditionally had an ESB that was a hub bespoke like a TIPCO big ass bus or an IBM big ass bus or an Oracle big ass bus uh, Fuse already was highly distributed in its runtime, which allows you to, uh, if some stuff fails, eh, doesn't impact the others, there's no single bus to fail, and uh, that really resonates well with the OpenShift thought. So these, these are a natural fit. AMQ is the messaging, it's a, uh, actually Fuse is a superset of AMQ, you get the messaging system when you buy Fuse as well. Data grid is a cache, it's a key value, again it's a key in memory key value store, but for uh, for RAM use cases, so uh, the old rapid access memory, uh, it's highly flexible, highly scalable, actually I use uh, data grid a lot for my external state, state saving within OpenShift. Uh, and then data virtualization, it works really well with OpenShift as an external provider, uh, soon TM will run inside the container as well. I actually think it's coming out this month, but don't pin me on that one. And then our mobile platform uh, uh, works on, uh, on OpenShift as well. So that was it from the theory side. Uh, if you have any more questions, Samuel and I will, uh, will be walking around. We want to help you guys with the workshop, but if you have any other questions, just let us know. rhhandlelab.tinyurl.com it, it should pass you to a Google Drive and in which it contains two files. Yes? So I'll press it to see if it actually works. Then else. In the Google Drive there's a worksheet. The worksheet contains the necessary data to connect to the system, except for the variable parts, which I have here, and I will give you guys in a bit. 
for the guys that, that want a little bit of theory and some advanced use cases, you can yet take the first document. The worksheet also contains a more simple, straightforward version of the uh, of a workshop. And on the Amazon machines you're getting, there's also a workshop. So there's three systems you can do. Uh, take your pick. So this is the tiny URL. I'll, uh, I'll hand over the connection details. If your machine is not working or you can't connect, let me know, you'll get a new one. I have 55 machines spin up, so you should be fine. So, for the ones that are wondering, the user is demo app. Yeah? Just checking, right? So, um, for the for the guys that are looking for the try it button, I know uh, the uh, the guide is a little bit different than the actual UI. Sorry about that. I uh, still need to update it. If you do add to project and you go to the node builder, that's this one and you see the git repository url there's a very small try it under the second button so there oh, I need to turn it off that one try it and it pre-populates the git url it's really really simple you log in do for that your oc commands can do but i would eerst weten wie je bent en uiteraard daar geldt weer voor oc login en dan Krijg je de username en password, dus demo, respectievelijk je wachtwoord.